Welcome everybody to our uh, October FPGA seminar and uh, welcome our uh, friends from the University of Guelph uh, and uh, Christian Fogel will uh, work with Gary Graywall and Deborah Stacey. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming this morning. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Guelph. Um, I'm just finishing up there, and uh, today I'll be talking about some of my, my PhD research involving developing uh, parallel placement methods uh, where we're working towards uh, forward scaling approaches uh, that enable us to uh, maintain serial equivalency that will allow us to obtain uh, the same algorithm behavior and results regardless of the number of cores that we're running on moving forward. Uh, so I'll start off just by briefly touching on the placement problem. Uh, then we'll look at uh, traditional swap-based approaches and how they work. Uh, then we'll look at some of the challenges that are uh, encountered when we try to parallelize those techniques. Uh, then we'll look at um, some of the issues that we run into uh, when, we, when we deal with those parallel methods and how we propose to, uh, to address those with our uh, implementation. Then we'll validate our approach by looking at some of our experimental results, and I'll conclude with uh, some conclusions in, in future work. So, as we all know, placement, we start with the netlist uh, that has all of the logic blocks with the connections between them, and of course we want to take those blocks, map them onto the target architecture while minimizing one or more objectives. Um, okay, so traditional approaches that work well, uh, are often based on swap-based iterative placement. So simulated annealing is the primary example of this, where we take our placement, we randomly select two blocks, and we evaluate what the, the effect will be if we apply that swap, if we move those blocks according to that swap. Uh, then we either reject it, in which case the placement will stay the same, or we accept it and we update the placement. Now, pro these, these approaches work well, they produce high quality results, but of course we run into the problem where we have FPGA sizes that are growing, uh, but oh, sorry, uh, this green line is the CPU single core frequency. And so the, the speed of single core processors are, as we all know, stagnating. And so fortunately we do have parallel computing throughput is still on the rise. So we have multi-core CPUs, uh, the, the peak throughput is still going up, uh, but uh, also we have many core architectures like GPUs or Intel's mic architecture. And so then ideally we'd like to be able to take advantage of these parallel architectures to speed up our, uh, our, placed, our placement times. But, uh, sorry. Okay. Um, now, if we look at doing this in parallel, ideally what we'd like to do is we'd like to make a variation of our single swap approach. We would take our placement, but instead of thinking of one move, we would identify many moves and evaluate them all at the same time. And then based on those moves, we would accept some of them, we would reject other ones, and then based on the ones that we wanted to keep, we would update the placement. So this sounds great, except there, of course, is a problem where what if these moves conflict with one another? And so we need to take that into account. So now let's look at some of the ways that this has been addressed. Uh, the first uh, type of approach, or category of approaches, is to uh, what I call partition placements. The idea here is to take the placement area and use spatial partitioning to divide up the placement region into these different sections and then have each core process each one of these sections independently. And by making a spatial division, you guarantee that there's no uh, collisions between the, the cores. So while this takes care of conflicts, unfortunately it does so at the expense of cost, or, uh, at the expense of quality, sorry. And the main reason for this, according to the authors, is that if you look at a traditional uh, serial uh, placement algorithm, the maximum distance that a block can move in a single move is the entire area of the chip, at least at the beginning of the search. Whereas if we split it up into uh, several partitions, 
then the maximum distance that a block can move is restricted. And in, in fact, this gets worse as we increase the number of cores that we're running on. We make that distance smaller and smaller, and so the quality continues to get worse as we increase the number of cores. So if we increase parallelism, our quality drops off uh, more and more. Uh, also, uh, this type of approach, the algorithm that's being applied changes, the behavior changes based on the number of cores that we're running on. So we don't maintain serial equivalency, uh, and, and uh, although they obtained reasonably high speed ups, this was on up to 60 cores, and in fact, their speed ups stopped scaling after about 18 cores. So they reached or 20 cores, they reached that 17.5 times speed up on about 20 cores and then it, it, it leveled off. Uh, and the main reason for this is there is still a significant portion of their algorithm that uh, was running in serial where that runtime scaled with the size of the problem as well. Yes? Isn't there another reason the quality gets worse in that the uh, estimates of wire length are in one region are based on the positions of things in another region and those, that data may be incorrect? So they, they did uh, trials uh, where they, they tested and they referred to those in their paper as these soft conflicts and that they're ignoring and they found that there was not an appreciable difference in quality based on ignoring yeah. this. So, uh, and that the main, the main difference was when they were, uh, uh, the main effect was this uh, distance. Um, and so, because of this, uh, the, the serial portion of their algorithm that scaled, uh, uh, the runtime scaled along with the size of the problem, uh, the parallelism was not scalable. So, another approach, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with here, uh, looks at uh, applying independent sets of moves. And so, to do this, uh, there, are, there are two kind of variations of this. There is uh, one that was just published this year. Uh, and the, the main idea here uh, in the first approach is to have multiple cores evaluating moves and entering the moves that they accept into a queue and then having the cores take turn processing that queue and then identifying uh, moves that would conflict with one another and then uh, I, uh, uh, rejecting those to be reevaluated based on the new uh, um, contents of those positions. Uh, and an improvement to that, uh, they uh, instead identified the conflicts before doing that evaluation. So in this case, there may have been evaluation done, and then that work was wasted in some cases. So in this approach, they uh, identified those conflicts a priori to save that wasted work. Uh, the benefit of this approach is that by serializing through this queue, or serializing through the, the identification of the conflicts beforehand, uh, you maintain quality because you maintain serial equivalence. And so regardless of the number of cores that are used, you uh, have the same algorithm behavior. Now, uh, to maintain the serial equivalence, uh, the, the speed ups were limited. <laughs> uh, they did not scale beyond eight cores at, at six times. Now, they did uh, include a transactional memory version of this, which lost the serial equivalence uh, deterministic aspect. Uh, and the speed ups were much higher, so it was uh, roughly 32 times on uh, 60 cores. But again, uh, that is, uh, there is a point of serialization there, it's just at the hardware level. So it's implied there, and then once you reach the boundaries of the hardware uh, um, uh, transactional memory, uh, limitations, then you stop to scale after that. So uh, again, this type of approach, while uh, better than, than previous approaches, uh, still lacks the true scalability. So we looked at those, uh, the, the, the issues that, 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 that these approaches had, and we went to uh, the developments that have been made recently in parallel programming in general. And we tried to see what we could do if we could apply some of the knowledge that had been gained there to our problem. And specifically, we looked at structured parallel patterns. And these are parallel patterns of computation that are not tied to any particular language uh, or architecture, but they are patterns that have been identified by uh, both Intel and NVIDIA as they're saying they, they provide libraries for, uh, for 
implementing these on their architectures, and they say, if you make your algorithms run on these patterns, then that is the type of algorithm that will scale well on our architectures. And so uh, I, we want to be able to take placement and perform it using these types of patterns to get those benefits. Um, and another benefit is that these patterns can be implemented to maintain serial equivalency. So that allows us to make, it makes it possible for us to get the same results regardless of what architecture we're running on. So as new architectures become available, we can get the speed up benefits and not have to worry about our quality dropping off at all. And for our implementation that I'll talk about in this paper, uh, we're using the NVIDIA Thrust library. Uh, but again, it's not tied to a particular library, this is just our one implementation of this. So what are some of these patterns? And I expect some of these will look familiar to, to you at least. Uh, we have map, which you take a single input, you apply one or more operations to it to produce an output. So it's a one-to-one -one mapping, then you apply some transformation. And then you're just applying that transformation over an, an, over an entire input list uh, to produce a corresponding output list. Then we have reduction, which uh, takes in, uh, it uses a binary operator to take pairs of input and uh, reduce them down to a single input. And then we just apply that recursively until we produce a single output value. And category reduction is a variation of this where before performing the reduction, we assign each of our inputs to a category and then perform reductions within each one of those categories. So in the, in the context of placement, this would correspond to uh, each, each entry at the bottom here could be a, a cost for a block and all of the inputs that would be uh, reduced for that would be the costs of the nets connected to that block, for instance. Um, the next pattern is filtering or stream compaction. And the idea here is to take an input list, apply some type of mask to it, and then collect only the items of interest. So we could, for instance, collect uh, the blocks that are moving within this iteration. And uh, lastly, here, there are more patterns, but this is the last one we'll look at, uh, because these are the main ones used in our approach, uh, is permutation scatter. So the idea here is you have your input list, you apply some type of reordering, and you get your output list. And all of these can be done efficiently in parallel uh, using uh, the, on GPUs, on multi-core, uh, or on uh, Intel's many-core microarchitecture. So then the question is, can we, or how can we apply these to the key elements of placement? Well, what are the operations we need to perform? Well, we need to compute the cost of all of the nets, of each net in the circuit. Uh, we also need to be able to compute a difference in cost based on moving each block to a new proposed location. So if we want to try moving many blocks in, at the same time, we need to be able to evaluate the cost of each one of those in parallel. And we can do both of these operations by using a map pattern followed by a category reduction. Then we also, based on those differences in cost, we need to decide whether or not to accept each one of those moves. And to do that, and we, then we need to apply the ones that we choose to accept. So how can we do that? Well, uh, we can use a map pattern to apply an assessment operation to each one of those to decide yes or no, whether to accept the moves and then a permutation scatter to update the placement accordingly. But that leaves the trickiest part, which is, okay, so we can evaluate everything, but how do we decide what moves we actually want to uh, test? And uh, what makes this tricky is, again, those conflicts that we may encounter. And let's look at those in more detail. So as uh, Jonathan brought up earlier, uh, we have the soft conflicts, which, uh, occur whenever two blocks are moved that are connected to the same net. And so those blocks are being moved and they may be using information that is stale to make the decision as to whether or not they should move. But uh, as was observed in this paper, uh, they observed no negative impact on quality and we observed the exact same phenomenon. So uh, we did not see any appreciable difference in quality due to ignoring these soft conflicts. But in addition to these soft conflicts, we have the hard conflicts. And these we, we can't ignore because ignoring them would result in, in invalid placement. So a hard conflict occurs whenever a block is assigned more than one destination. So either two, two or more moves assigned to the same block is a conflict, 
or two blocks assigned to the same location is also a conflict. So one of the uh, one way again to, to, to solve this is the partitioning, or the more successful uh, in terms of quality at least is the detect and repair mechanism. So uh, uh, identifying when that occurs and then uh, repairing accordingly. Uh, but again, this while maintaining determinism, uh, this doesn't scale uh, to more than eight cores because serialization is uh, the killer of parallel programming. So what can we do to address this? Well, we set, taking those, those things into account. Okay. Just to, you could just go back one. Soft conflicts will destroy mm -hmm. determinism, okay? depending on the race. Uh, oh, sorry. OK, so soft conflicts, they will, they will affect determinism if you, uh, but not in the approach we're taking because we are applying the same behavior regardless of the number of cores we're running on. And so what we do is we generate a large set of, of proposed moves, and then whether you're running on a single core or you're running on 100 cores, we're evaluating all of those before we make any decision. And so it's the same behavior regardless of, of, how, of, of how many cores you're running on. <coughs> Uh, so our goals then for our, our method of generating moves were to uh, avoid hard conflicts from the get-go. So rather than, uh, in order to avoid detecting and, and repairing, which is expensive, we wanted to avoid them from the start. Uh, the next thing, we wanted to make sure that we were able to still uh, evaluate all, or generate all possible moves that could be considered by a traditional annealer. And lastly, we wanted to make sure that it was efficient. You needed to be able to compute for each block to compute the move that it should be doing independently of the rest of the blocks and in constant time. And uh, these are the keys that we felt were necessary to have a successful uh, parallel implementation. So how might we do this? Well, let's first start by looking at what a traditional annealer would do. We would randomly select a block in the placement. Then we would randomly select a target position within its vicinity. So in this example, we'll consider a position two to the right. And we'll propose that as a move. But if that block moved to that position, we would need to do something with its target block. Uh, so the easiest thing to do is, of course, assign it a complementary move to form a swap. Now, assuming that th these moves were taking place, what are some of the other moves in this area that we could apply without uh, but that would not conflict with these. Uh, let's look at the next block over. We could also assign it a move two positions to the right, and then its target block, we could assign it a complementary move to the left to form a second swap. Okay, well, if we continue on, let's look at the next block. Well, here we encounter a hard conflict if we were going to assign it a move, because it has already been assigned a move two to the left, so assigning another move over here would result in a hard conflict. So we, we can just skip that block. But we have the same situation with the next block over as well, where it's been assigned a, a move to the left from the second swap. Uh, and so this would be a hard conflict. But if we move to the next block over, we can now assign a move, because it hasn't been assigned a move yet, and its target block can form another swap. And we can move over and do that again. And in fact, we can keep applying this uh, over and over again to generate moves along the entire row of the FPGA and guarantee that we don't have any hard conflicts. Now, here we show up for a move distance of two, but in fact, this type of pattern can work in general, where we, have a, uh, we define a move distance that we want to move, and then we uh, assign a move to the right of that many contiguous blocks, uh, followed by a set of blocks of the same length, moving in the opposite direction. OK, so this gives us non-conflicting moves across the entire uh, grid by only having to define this, this move distance. But it doesn't allow us to evaluate or, or to, to propose all possible moves along that row. And to do that, we need to introduce a second parameter, which we call a shift parameter. So again, let's look at a single row of the FPGA. We'll again apply a, 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 a pattern with move distance of two. And we'll start with this version of it as we'll call this shift zero. And then as we increase the shift, we simply take the pattern and we slide it over one. 
And as we do this, you'll notice that some of the blocks are now assigned positions that would be out of bounds. So for those, we just ignore those, those moves. So we, we, don't, we would not move those blocks during this iteration. Uh, as we continue shifting, we eventually end up back at our starting point. And this happens, uh, the, the uh, effective shift values are between zero and twice the move distance. Um, so by combining a distance parameter with a shift parameter, we can generate all possible moves along the row of the FPGA while avoiding hard conflicts. Now, we've shown it for a row, but in placement we want to operate in two dimensions. So fortunately, we can easily extend this approach to two or more dimensions. Uh, I haven't found a useful reason to go to more yet, but if there is, it can be done. So we do this by generating a random move distance in each of the dimensions. So a uh, move distance of two along the rows, move distance of three along the columns. And then we randomly generate a shift value for each of them as well. And we apply the shift to move the patterns accordingly. And notice we apply the same pattern to each one of these rows and the same pattern to each column. And then we treat those two patterns as orthogonal components, which we add together to produce a two-dimensional move for each block, or each position in the, in the placement grid. So for example, this block is moved two to the right and three down, and the, its uh, complementary block is moved three up and two to the left. So by doing this, we are able to generate moves for the entire placement grid by generating two random numbers in each dimension regardless of the, of the size of the FPGA. Um, and so each block can then compute its move in constant time and this can be done independently from all of the other blocks. So this is the last piece of the puzzle that we need to implement all of the key operations of placement using structured parallel patterns. And so by using that pattern, we can apply a map pattern to, uh, to assign a move to each block. And then we can optionally then filter down only the blocks that are moving within a given iteration. So then taking this pattern approach, we applied those structured parallel patterns. And we wanted to see, uh, we are introducing some bias by using these patterns to generate our moves. So we wanted to see what the impact would be on quality. So to evaluate that, we developed a GPU implementation of, of this approach using the NVIDIA Thrust library. And we ran it uh, along with DPR, um, a set of IWLS uh, benchmarks that ranged uh, to uh, they were, they were larger than the MCNC benchmarks, so we wanted to test how the performance was scaling. And we conducted 10 trials for each of these benchmarks, uh, running DPR uh, with interim <laughs> equal to 1. And then for our algorithm, we used the same annealing schedule as DPR, and to try and have a common point of reference to compare from, we executed the same number of moves per temperature as DPR with interim equal to 1. And we tested our approach, or our implementation on the three video cards that we had available to us, uh, increasing order of performance. So first of all, we just wanted to see, is this performing a similar search to what VPR is doing? So here, this, this graph is showing a few values across. So along, along the bottom axis here, we're seeing the temperature stages in the temperature schedule. So, uh, how these values, we have the cost in the blue here, uh, which is decreasing as, as, we, as our search progresses. We have the red is the R limit, so the distance away that we're, that we're uh, proposing to move moves. And then the green is the success ratio. So VPR, uh, the annealing schedule, once we reach about 40%, then we want to try and maintain 40% success ratio by dropping off the R limit. And uh, the, oops, sorry, that kind of is off the bottom of the screen there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, well, I don't want to go too far now. But you can see here we have similar curves. So, uh, now one variation, you'll, you'll see the R limit starts dropping a little sooner than here, but that also varies from, from run to run. So that's not, not, that's not too critical. Uh, but what we wanted to look for here is a similar shape uh, the success ratio, uh, it's a little more choppy, uh, but we are applying these, these, these uh, moves in parallel. Uh, and so there is some stale data, but we're seeing the overall trend 
is, seems to be the same. So then uh, we wanted to look at yeah. it. It, uh, it seems like your temperature is dropping like noticeably more slowly. Is that uh, intentional or just uh, so or? That, this is just how uh, it, it's not intentional. Uh, this is just we wanted to use uh, run it using the exact same settings and then use that as a baseline. Uh, there could certainly be tuning that could be done to try and, and see uh, what what impact this would have. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Um, so here we, we show our results. So for each, each benchmark we're showing, on the left-hand side are the uh, post-routing critical path uh, results for VPR, and then we have our algorithm. And this is a, a, the, the, the range over the 10 trials for each, uh, each benchmark. And then on the right-hand side of each graph, we have the same thing, but for VPR's wire length versus from our algorithm. And uh, overall, we found that uh, we improved both wire length and critical path delay about 5% from uh, the results that we obtained from DPR. But I, I want to note again that here, because we're using these structured parallel patterns, it now is possible to get these, uh, to, to use these patterns to make, make serial equivalency possible. And by doing this, then we can ensure that we maintain quality regardless of which architecture we're running on. So if there's faster GPUs that come out, you run it, you, don't even need to, you shouldn't even need to recompile your code, and you should just be able to run faster and get the same results. So then here we've addressed uh, quality. It seems that our approach, even though we're introducing bias, we're able to produce high quality results. But then we want to look at the runtime behavior. So here we, we show, uh, we have three lines on this plot one corresponding to each of the video cards they ran with. And along the x-axis, we have the connection count in the netlist, so that's a representation of the size of the netlist that we're running on. And then on the y-axis, we have the speed up relative to DPR. And so at the bottom, we have zero, and this is 30 times at the top. And what we see here is these are all just zoomed-in versions of, of these different uh, uh, trends on the graph. Uh, what we see here is that for all of these video cards, there's an increasing speed up as the size of the problem grows. And so uh, one of the reasons for this uh, we expect is that we are not utilizing all of the available resources on these uh, video cards yet. So we can look at that in a couple of ways. And one way we can look at it, there may be other useful work that we could be doing uh, in, that, in those extra resources to help improve the quality of the search. But also, uh, this suggests that we should be able to continue observing speedups on as benchmark sizes increase, even with current architectures. Um, and we, we found that on the, fast, on the fastest video card that we ran on, we obtained between uh, 16 and 28 times speed up over, over VPR. And again, we're using these structured parallel patterns, which Intel and NVIDIA are recommending to uh, achieve forward scaling on their architectures. So uh, summarizing against the, the previous approaches, we have the, the partition placement, which avoid conflicts. Uh, but at the, as we increase parallelism, we have a drop off in quality because we're not maintaining a deterministic algorithm. And uh, the scalability is not there, again, because they have part of their serial code scales along, the runtime of it scales along with the problem size. Then we have the other approaches that are far more promising in terms of quality, because uh, we maintain serial equivalency. But by doing so, we are restricted with the speedups that we're able to obtain. So here, we're, we're limited, no, no speedup gains after eight cores. And so these are not, uh, do not appear to be scalable. Uh, so we have a pro uh, uh, proposed an approach using structured parallel patterns to target modern many core architectures. And we were able to uh, get a, a, about a 5% improvement in quality while maintaining the, the possibility of determinism. And so uh, we were able to get a 16 to 28 uh, times speed up on the fastest GPU. We also saw speed up even just running on, on a single core. Uh, and in fact, we have a, a, t a better tuned version of this now. This speed up is even higher. Um, but the key here again is using these structured patterns to, to have forward scaling code to new architectures. So we've presented an approach to map all of the key operations from placement 
over to structured parallel patterns such that all of our serial code is constant time. And uh, we've also, to make this possible, we've uh, developed and proposed a novel, a novel uh, method for generating very large sets of swaps that are guaranteed to be free of hard conflicts. And by doing so, we've, we're able to achieve uh, comparable performance, in fact, improving slightly, and achieve uh, speed ups of almost 30% on commodity hardware. So this is, would be, the, in fact, the, the video card that we were using, the best one, is now two generations old, and the, uh, the, the, the latest uh, card in a similar class is over four times the computational throughput. So even a, even if we're pessimistic, we expect to see a speed up improvement of double of this. Um, so, and so in terms of future work, we're looking at uh, using other objectives and calculating them using these structured parallel approaches as well. Uh, we've completed uh, applying this to path-based timing calculations, uh, but we would also like to look at congestion and power uh, and perhaps other objectives. We also want to look at targeting uh, other parallel implementations. So again, these patterns aren't tied to any particular language or architecture. So we want to look at uh, Intel has their threading building blocks and SOAP Plus that can be used to implement these patterns uh, and uh, the Intel mic architecture. But also at, at FPL, we saw a lot of uh, work on these data flow engines for FPGA. Because these structured parallel patterns are just that, they're very structured, uh, it may be possible to generate a hardware accelerated version of such an algorithm as well. And finally, we'd like to apply these approaches to other combinatorial optimization problems, uh, such as in EDA, we could look at, at routing or look towards a ASIC place and route, but also to problems even outside of that domain, looking at a vehicle routing problem or DNA sequencing. Uh, or, in fact, any, any type of permutation and coded problem that uh, we expect uh, to be. This should work on whether or not it, it uh, works well or not. This is another thing for those problems. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, I will take any questions. Uh, so which, I see how it's true that any you can do all the moves you could do in a previous annealer from any two positions, right? But I don't. The combinatorial space of those moves is reduced because I can't move here to here and then necessarily maybe here to here because things are constrained by that pattern of movement that you had. Mm -hmm. So have you thought about? I guess one of two things. One, kind of more from a set or like you know a math perspective of how that correlation might affect the the problem, and then two, because you're getting better quality in placement. Is this saying that you know you don't need as much randomness in a placement problem that you might in other simulated annealing problems, or has your were your solution just generally going to be performed very well in any other simulation annealing oh, problem? I, I, I do not think that that can be said for any algorithm that will. I mean, the no free lunch, right? So you can't take one algorithm and expect it to perform well on, on all the other problems. Uh, I I think the, in terms of in terms of the moves, uh, the like the, the relation between, I mean, you're, you're talking about a, a temporal relation between the possibilities of the moves that you can take. Right? Yeah, because right. you, you, like, although you can get any two moves, you, yep. you, you cannot get a gen generically random set of moves. Right, so right. It's, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> I, I would welcome a, a suggestion for an experiment to, to test that out. Uh, our approach was to look, do that from statistical testing, right? Like, so to, to try it and see what the effect is by running many runs and comparing it statistically. Um, I think it's, yeah. It's, yeah I'm just wondering if, if, this, if you uncovered something more generally true about the simulating and healing process in general, right? Rather than something very specific to the placement problem. Uh, whether, yeah, this can be applied in other domains. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Which version of VTR were you using and comparing to? Uh, so, th this was five. Okay. You want to be careful of six. Six has a significant CPU time bug in it. So, five, oh, okay. <laughs> five is good, seven is good. Six is okay. a little bit uh, minimum. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, Go ahead. Sir. Do you have a feel for how many moves you tried on the GPU version versus the CPU version? Like, it's, so it's roughly equivalent. So if we look at, 
But like, so how are you counting a set of block moves? Like, if I take ten blocks and swap them with the blocks down, so right, that, that's counting. That's one counting as ten moves. Okay. So. Um, and each one, so these are the temperature schedules, uh, or the, 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 the temperature iterations. Uh, and so for each one of these iterations, I was targeting the same number of moves the DPR was doing for each one of those iterations. And so not, and a move there is a one-to-one -one move. So it's not one block, move, one, one set of blocks is not a move. It's each individual one of those moves. So it's a one-to-one -one moves to VPR. There is, I mean, some slight variation because the number of iterations you do is dependent on, uh, on the state, because the, the exit criteria is based on the cost. So, uh, so you'll see like this might have taken a few more iterations than this one, but then for another benchmark, it, I mean, even different ones are the same thing. So the number of, of temperature stages, or the number of temperature iterations uh, may vary, but the number of moves in each iteration is the same. So uh, the inner num in VPR, you set that value and the number of moves done in each one, of, so these are going from zero to 170, and each one of those, uh, you're doing n, uh, the number of blocks to the exponent 1.33. So you're doing that many, you're evaluating that many moves at each one of these ticks along the bottom. And then the inner num, if you change that inner num, you're just multiplying it. So if you do inner num 10, you're doing 10 times the number of blocks to the exponent 1.33. So for both of these approaches, uh, to try and get an even comparison, uh, perform the same number of moves in each tick as VPR does. Yeah, it just seems remarkable that you get better quality by having less randomness. Maybe that's what brain is getting at. I think part of the, the reasoning is uh, that um, you, you, you may be able to squeeze out more uh, towards the end of the placement uh, so maybe I can demonstrate this real quick. I have a, this, this app, just to demonstrate some of the parallel moves. So later on in the search, it may be beneficial to not be so random. So. This one. So what this is showing is all the moves that, that are being evaluated, and then we can just, like, just to get an idea of what's happening there. Um, so later on in the search, it may be beneficial to get more even spread. So if you're randomly selecting blocks, you, like, statistically you should eventually get to trying to move all of them that little bit. But in our approach, you end up moving, uh, in most cases, every single block you evaluate a move for it in every uh, parallel iteration uh, laid in the search. Because the, 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 the range of, of moves you can move is, is so low, so every block is, is attempted to move. Whereas VPR, if you, if you randomly generated a set of moves that large, if you did that enough times, then statistically you would get the same number of moves for every block. But uh, practically speaking, that's probably not the case. You're probably getting some blocks that are not being evaluated, are not having a move evaluated for them for many moves in a row uh, during the, the last iteration. So this could be potentially one reason, and this this could be replicated certainly uh, in, in DPR. Like there's nothing that you couldn't, if there was some uh, behavioral component to this, that could certainly be uh, implemented in serial as well. Yeah. Do your benchmarks have heterogeneity in them? Ram blocks, DSP blocks? Uh, like so that? so they don't. Um, but there, there is nothing uh, that is stopping them from being handled uh, in this approach. Uh, in fact, that's how we're handling the I.O. blocks. So they are treated, uh, they have to be treated differently than this. And for the I.O. blocks, uh, we tried kind of the simplest thing we could think of and we ended up sticking with it because it seemed to work. Uh, where we just treat it as a one-dimensional permutation and, uh, and then applied the patterns that we would do along a row or along a, col along a column, we just apply to that one-dimensional I.O. permutation and just move things around in there. And that, that worked uh, quite well. And so we expect a, a similar thing uh, could be used for uh, heter uh, heterogeneous blocks where uh, because there's so many fewer of those blocks than uh, the other types of blocks, uh, then 
Um, we, we expect applying even something simple like that, where you would just maybe have a permutation for the, all of the positions of blocks of that type and just swap between those, uh, that, that would likely give you a reasonable result. Is, is that on your future work to, to try it? Uh, so it may not be <laughs> in my future work, but it is in, I, I think, apologize in, in the group's future work. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting future. Yes, the yes. Is that if so, you look at um, I mean, what you said makes sense, and I think you could fit it in your formulation. The if you look at the latest commercial FPGAs, their logic blocks still dominate, but not vastly. Okay. Right. So you, you're probably using right now single are you using a single LED architecture for your logic block or? Uh, I am. Uh, yeah. So uh, if you look at the heterogeneity, I do two things simultaneously. Like basically move to like a clustered logic block that is representative of a commercial chip and put in the same amount of heterogeneity, and there are architecture files for that for VPR. The reason is then you'll wind up with, you know, so approximately one out of every five blocks would be something that's not okay. a uh, logic block. So logic blocks still dominate, but not by like a huge factor. So it makes it a more, you have to be a little careful. So are those, are those still, is that a, a particular resource is either being treated as a logic block or something else, or that a specific location is the uh, the different functionality. Yeah, like the functionality is based location based. So you have yeah. RAM blocks yep. are the second most common kind of block. So so then uh, I, I would expect that if if a simple like one dimensional permutation didn't work, you could certainly use a combination of the two. So yeah. you could uh, just apply a grid, but uh, so you could still do two dimensional. Um, but, uh, yeah, hey, certainly that could well, be. Well, it all makes sense to me. I mean, I, did, yeah. I agree. It seems like they used to, or it certainly could be extended to that. I think you'll probably find some interesting, essentially, tuning and heuristics, but right. there's a, there'll be many ways you could extend it, and we usually see which ones work the best. So. Sure. And you also get larger benchmarks once you go into that world. Right. So, so and your whole thing's about scaling. So if we've got bonds, maybe this group is tightening benchmarks, which are huge. So. Right. <laughs> well, they behave a little differently because they're a little more chunky too. So they're big benchmarks, but they've been clustered into bigger things, which reflects what's in commercial FPGA. So it'll change, changes the project problem a little bit. Like I mean, your count sure. of nets per block is different. It varies now more based on the kind of block. Um, nothing seems to fundamentally break your your algorithms, but it may be really the interesting tuning sure. results that we may be retuning. And, and one thing that I, I hadn't mentioned here is uh, we I've shown our the method that we've used here for generating moves in the, these patterns. But really, uh, this approach, uh, the, the bulk of the approach can be used regardless of the source of those moves. So really, if you can come up with any, uh, so since in, in my, my thesis work, uh, I'm talking about it in terms of just concurrent uh, groups of associated moves. So in the context of, of a traditional annual, that would be two moves that are being done together, that because if they're not done together, you get an invalid placement. So you need to do a swap uh, to avoid a conflict. But you could uh, envision um, if you had, say, four blocks, and this one moved down here, this one moved over here, this one moved over there, this one moved over here. And this is, uh, I've seen some papers talk about like a ripple move effect, right? Um, so, but those types of moves, there could be other patterns that would generate uh, things along those same lines. And so we're not limited to doing swaps anymore. Uh, you could potentially do much larger changes to the placement uh, at once. So uh, uh, heterogeneity is certainly something to look into. Uh, and, but we also want to look at things like uh, moving, using different patterns to generate moves. Uh, and also, we have somebody in our lab right now looking at incorporating other uh, uh, analytic-based uh, 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 approaches and combining them with, with, the, with these uh, calculations as well. Okay. Question. How, do, how does D and S vary throughout uh, the idea? Like, so, so D is uh, so, so, so D is just varies with the R limit. Okay. So. Uh, D is the, the you, you instead of randomly select so it would go the, the similar way to VPR when it when it's selecting a random move it selects a random uh, x value between uh, the R limit and its current position uh, we we do a move within uh, like uh, an R limit away from the block we set the distance based on that so all your permutation patterns are at the maximum R limit for that. Yeah. <coughs> 
And then the shift is always, uh, the effective shift value is always between zero and twice the mean distance, because after that it repeats. So just following that, that, that seems counterintuitive to me, because at the beginning, you're going to move chunkier things in large distances at a time when in, early in the annealer, you wouldn't necessarily have placed things together that are, should be relatively structured. And then near the very end, you're going to be doing so, very small. So that so seems maybe, like it would, um, it would look lower quality if there's a CPR. So I think part of another thing that helps with that is that early on in the search, with our current patterns, we're, again, we're ignoring moves that would go out of bounds. Uh, so we move up to here. So in this case, you see, if we apply the patterns, this is what we would get, and the rest of the light blue area would be going out of bounds. Um, so in this case, many of the moves aren't being done. Uh, and if, but in this case, the shorter distance allows you to move more things. So uh, this could be potentially part of, of, of what allows you to still get the global exploration early on. Uh, however, there needs to be a balance there, and in fact, part of the reason we're, we're looking at different pattern generation methods is within these empty kind of regions, we could apply a secondary pattern and do things in there. Uh, it does complicate the pattern generation method, but not incredibly so. You could have, uh, say, like a, 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 so it is constant time right now for each block. You could make it some small constant times that. Uh, to say I want to make up to you know, five patterns um, in, in each dimension. Um, so, uh, but it may be that by doing that we, we lose some of the, uh, the help. So maybe this is actually in fact helping us by, by having this. But, yes? to just follow up on that question. Did you say that you, you, set, you randomly choose a value for dx and dy from zero to or one to the range limit, or do you always pick the maximum? like what the range limit currently is. So let's say the range limit is six. Six units vertically, six units horizontally is the current range limit. Do you pick a number from one to six in each dimension for your D, or do you always pick six? No, I pick one to six. Okay, Random. nice. Yeah. I just, yeah, treat it as the upper bound. So just continuing, uh, so moving on to one time, it seems like if for your move generation, you get sometimes like sections that are empty. I also imagine on the ship itself, there are locations that don't have blocks. So do you know if that creates some sort of like one time imbalance between threads? So early on in the search, um, we need to apply, we do, uh, with our current implementation, there needs to be more uh, sets of moves applied to reach the, the number of moves for that iteration. So you need to apply more parallel sets to, to uh, achieve the same number of, of evaluated moves. Um, but uh, we, so we can address that by looking at uh, filling in these gaps by, with, with other patterns that would, that would make use of that area. But that may cut into uh, quality as well. Because if, if this is actually beneficial to us that early on we're not moving everything all the time, uh, then we may lose some of that. So there is an impact on, on runtime, although we still see the majority of the runtime, uh, once that R limit drops off, uh, then the majority of blocks are moving, uh, on average, uh, near the majority of the blocks are moving, because so many moves are being done uh, in the later iterations that it does help offset these cases where we do have empty regions. So, yeah? This might be basically the same question or not. What happens when you have an FPG that's almost empty? Uh, like my, my design is only 3% of the FPGA. So we're only evaluating blocks that are moving. So the, only, the amount of work that's actually being done uh, is, 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 is small. So it, uh, if, there's, if you have a few blocks, then only the blocks that are moving will have their costs updated. To see what the new cost is. So, right, but I'm imagining your proposal looks look, looks geometric. You would apply the proposal operator to the entire grid, which yep. is 95 percent empty. Is that waste of work? Uh, it's not waste of work because if you're applying it to when it's empty, you're not actually applying it if nothing based on that pattern is affected by that pattern. So if you apply this pattern and none of the blocks are occupying positions that are affected by that pattern, then you don't evaluate it. You just skip and do a new pattern. 
Right, would you still need to check whether there is something there in order to... And that, that is very, very low complexity. Like, the, the runtime for that is insignificant compared to the rest of the algorithm. That check is, is very quick. And more often than not, if you care about parallel placement, you're probably not going to do it on chips that are basically empty. Yeah, and, and that's a, I guess that's a good point. Like, if, if, if your placement is sufficiently small, then you can just use a serial and you'll... Right, right. It would require that you would maintain two algorithms. No, I'm, I'm saying that this should work, but in the worst case scenario, you could. Okay. Do you have, uh, I mean, do your results include transfer time to the GPU, and, and so, how do you break things up between the GPU and the CPU? So everything exists, uh, there is one load of the netlist information onto the GPU at the beginning, and then everything stays on the GPU and calls done. So it does all the control code, Every, temperature so, updates, everything? Well, so, no, so temperature update, anything, uh, the only operations that are done on the CPU are constant time. They don't scale at all with, with the netlist. So uh, I am doing the temperature update on the CPU, uh, but it, it could be done on the GPU. It's, it's just a matter of the right. bookkeeping. But it, it is uh, insignificant. Because, because none of the CPU code is scaling with the size of the netlist, uh, then the, the runtime is, is dominated by the parallel time. What about this timing analysis done on the CPU or the GPU? GPU. So the GPU is doing the timing analysis update and that could account. Well, so if these results aren't showing the aren't showing the timing results, but we have implemented timing. Now, part of the issue with timing is there is uh, because you need to do a graph traversal. There is some interdependence, so you can't do everything in parallel. So uh, in that case, everything is done on the GPU, but you have to do it in the number of steps that's equal to the number of delay levels in your logic. So the number. Of, of re registered levels, but that is typically quite, I'm sure you know, but typically quite small compared to, so even on the largest netlist that we were using, it was uh, maybe on the order of tens of levels, uh, but, but that is scaling far slower than the, 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 the site. And, and uh, interestingly, uh, even outside of the context of a program, the timing calculations could be done for the serial annealer uh, on the GPU as well, um, just to update the update the criticalities um, and then use them. So just so I know, though, these results are basically the moves. The timing analysis in this case was done on the CPU, could be moved to the GPU, so you have results. So th that. this was only wire length with these ones. But okay. we do have timing uh, uh, that we're, we're running experiments now uh, to compare against timing based. Oh, OK. So, so the, the critical path results are from a wire length driven replacement. They are. Okay. Oh, thanks. But the wire length results are also there. So, uh, sure. uh, yes? Just a quick clarification on the selection of D. Uh, does that selection happen for every move or for every iteration of the annealer? Every iteration of the annealer. So for one iteration of the annealer, all blocks are moving the same distance? Correct. Okay. And by that logic, because you're canceling ones that go out of the, out of the bounds, there will likely be more moves at the end of the annealing process. Absolutely. Which is the opposite of what normal similarity annealing does. Well, sorry, there, there's, there's, so there, there's more, so there's a difference between number of parallel iterations and the number of temperature updates. So I am targeting the same number of moves, regardless of how many parallel sets of moves I need to apply to reach that number at each temperature. Oh. Okay, so uh, thank the speaker one more time.